turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15, as we are now going to get into really unpacking uh, the parable of the prodigal. And if you were here uh, last week in the introduction, there's a reason why maybe some of you are uh, wondering, shouldn't it say son, or shouldn't it say something here? You mean the parable of the prodigal what? And that's deliberate, because as you begin to look deeper into this famous, in fact, it's the most beloved parable of all of the Bible, that it is in fact the parable of the prodigal son, it is the parable of the prodigal father, it's the parable of the prodigal older son, we'll read about him and study about him in a few weeks, all that to say Jesus is explaining to us about the prodigal God. See, what do you mean by that? The word prodigal in the original language is extravagant. In the context of the parable, we understand it rightly that it, it's a negative sense to us that the prodigal son is a bad boy, and he is. But the reason why he is bad is because he has made some decisions that led him to a certain point in his life to leave home. And in his extravagant living, he lived for himself and wound up in poverty, wound up in destruction. The word prodigal, again, meaning extravagant. He was a foolish boy, lived in a stupid way, extravagantly, prodigally, and messed up. The father, with really a sense of of no shame at all, he, he cast all culture to the wind, and we'll see next time together that he runs out to meet his son against all of the traditions and protocols of the culture. He, he throws it away, and he is the prodigal father. He is reckless and abandoned with his love when he sees his son coming back, and he blows the, the mind of the people in the village, and they just can't believe what they're seeing. Jesus paints that picture in this parable. It is powerful. And then the prodigal son, the elder son, he's angry. He, he may not leave the house, but he is prodigal. He's angry with his father. He's angry with his brother. He's uh, disgruntled. He's grumpy. He's self-righteous. And uh, we'll see in a few weeks where a lot of the scribes and Pharisees may fit that bill that the son, the older son, is living out. Um, I've been good. I've been fine. Why can't you be, you know, super nice to me and, and lavish me with a fatted calf and all these special gifts? And he's self-centered. He's just as prodigal as the son that left. It's very, very powerful. Luke chapter 15, and uh, hold your finger there at verse 11. We'll come back to it in a moment. It's interesting to note that as we get into this parable tonight, last week was the introduction to it. Tonight, really, as we study it, we'll get into uh, the actual makeup of it, that uh, Charles Dickens wrote about this parable, and he said, and I quote, the parable of the prodigal is the finest short story ever written, and it is considered by those who study the writings of cultures in the world that, and this is, listen, this is non-believers speaking. They said that this parable of Jesus's is probably the greatest, most compact, powerful revelation of man's emotion regarding sin, restoration, and forgiveness that has ever been penned by a human. Well, okay, but more than a human penned it. The Holy Spirit used Luke to write an account that actually happened. You say, what does that matter? It matters everything to you and I. Because you and I were once prodigals, or maybe we are believers and somebody in the house tonight could, could be a prodigal. You've walked away from God even though you're a child of God. Or maybe someday in your life you'll become a prodigal. You're going to want to remember this. And of course, as I mentioned, the person who's not a Christian at all can certainly be tied into this parable of being a prodigal. It's interesting to um, also remember that that word prodigal is that extravagance, that incredible abandonment of lavish living. But the context dictates everything of its meaning. And I hope that as we leave this place tonight that we will choose to be 
a prodigal in our love toward others, extravagant in our love towards other people, that we would start singling people out. we got to stop being um, isolated from others. We are Americans, I know that. It's kind of a bummer how we've gotten into this groove of don't invade my space. Um, it's funny because I think that's a California luxury. Uh, you, ought to, you ought to go to New York City someday or go to a subway in China or in Russia. There ain't no space. And uh, if there is some way to get your body into that subway car, you're going to do it. And uh, man, I have been, uh, I've been in Russia in, in the subway at rush hour, and it is nuts because uh, people just cram in, and I don't know, but if you can't breathe, it's okay. Your space is invaded. Listen, as, as Christians, we ought to tolerate from here on out our space being invaded, and we start... Uh, mingling, as it were, with one another to care about each other, to find out about each other, and to love on each other because we should be prodigal regarding love, extravagant about it. That's the ultimate goal in this parable of the prodigal. So the first thing we look at tonight is this, verses 11, 19, is the parable of the prodigal son. And it begins there in verse 11. It says, then he said. You ought to circle those three words. It's powerful. I'll tell you why in a moment. Then he said. A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of the goods that falls to me. So he divided. This is remarkable. He, the father, divided to them his livelihood. All that he has. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all. The word actually is to liquidate. So all that was given, property, cattle, tools, equipment, uh, wells, uh, mines, who knows what it is. He liquidates them all. He's, he turns them into cash and he journeys into a far country. And there he wastes his possessions with, here it is, extravagant prodigal living. And when he had spent all, there arose a seer severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want, in need. And then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, a Gentile. And he sent him, that is the Gentile sent this Jewish boy into the fields to feed pigs, swine. That's bad enough for a Jew right there. Verse 16, and he would gladly, look at this, have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. He would look at those pigs and envy what they were eating compared to what he had. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired or skilled craftsmen. We'll come to this at the end. The word is skilled craftsman. One of your servants. So listen, those three words that open up verse 11, they're key. And I'll tell you the reason why. When it says here, then he said. That is powerful because these words mean that they're key to what Jesus got done saying. What does that mean? In Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10, there are two parables uh, that precede this third one. And as a Bible student, you ought to be asking, why is that important? When he says this, what's the big deal? Because Jesus is building up to a crescendo. It's a brilliant way of teaching. He first of all tells the parable about the shepherd who has a lost lamb, and he goes after it. And he's communicating the love of God for the lost, He leaves the 99, goes after the one that's wayward, and he finds it and brings it back. And then the second parable is Jesus talks about the woman who lost that coin, and she does everything she can to find that lost coin. And he's building, and now he drives it home with this profound parable that everybody in that culture, everyone listening in the audience, they're going to get it. It is, it's, it's actually a parable of the unthinkable. It's a shocker. And Jesus delivers it in such a way that it had to blow everybody's mind. And we'll, we'll get into the background and we'll get into the application. We'll get into the historical meaning of it tonight. And then I hope we get into the, what does it mean to us? 
And so we begin with this. The prodigal son, number one, verses 11 to 12, is rejects the authority of others. Can you write that down? What makes a prodigal a prodigal? Are you a prodigal tonight? How did you get to where you're at tonight? By rejecting authority. You and I live in an age, or we, we live in a prodigal age. Can I say that? We live in an age that thinks authority is evil. You want to know something? Throughout human history, and by the way, biblical teaching as well, when a generation or when a culture throws off authority, they're right on the brink of anarchy. America is flirting with anarchy. It basically rises up and says, uh, no one's going to tell me what to do. And there's this disgust for authority. And yet, to disgust authority or to despise authority, the Bible says you're rejecting the very authority of God. Did you know that? God establishes authority. Romans chapter 13 tells us that the police officer who drives around in the car or on the motorbike is none other than a, a tool or a servant of the Most High God. Did you know that? You say, that's ridiculous. Look, watch out. <laughs> God says, I've placed that person in authority with the badge to keep the peace, and if you reject his authority, you're going to pay the price. That's an amazing thing. God is a God of authority. See, the thing is this. Either we know bad authority or we know good authority, and regardless if it's good or bad, in the context of what is in us, around us in life, we need to be obedient to that. Now, look, if the authorities say disobey God, then what does the Bible say about that? The Bible says disobey that authority. The king told Daniel, don't pray anymore. What did Daniel do? He went home from the order and prayed. The Roman Empire told the disciples, don't preach anymore in Jesus' name. And so what did they do? They walked out and they started preaching five minutes outside the, after they got out of court. That is holy disobedience. But that's not what we're talking about regarding this authority. In verses 11 and 12, it says, A certain man, Jesus says, had two sons. And the younger of them said to the father, Father, give me. This is amazing. We don't get it in the English. He's ordering his father. The young son says, Hey, this is a shock. He tells his father, In that culture, you got to remember something. You could get stoned to death in that culture for acting like this. Jesus paints a parable, and everybody's listening. They must be gripped that a boy comes in, the youngest comes in and says, hey, here's the deal. I want you to give me my inheritance in advance. Let's pretend you're dead, Dad. That's what it means. You drop dead... Give me what's coming to me in advance. I want it now. It's a shock. And yet in our culture, we can begin to feel a little bit when we put it like that. He wants what he wants. And he says, give me. He orders his father the portion of goods that fall to me. Hey, dad, you know, I mean, who knows? There's 10 years. You got 10 years left, five years, 20 years left. I don't know. It doesn't matter. I want what is coming to me. I want it now. And in that culture, it is to wish your father dead. There's probably nothing more painful in a parent's life than for a child to be ungrateful. I think, I think a parent can forgive a lot of things, but that's one thing that a parent will forgive, but there's a scar that's left in the heart of a parent whose, whose generosity and love has been rejected with unthankfulness that, that scars the heart. And this, Jesus is painting this picture. This man is offending his father terribly. No, a shock. The whole crowd gasped when Jesus says this. There Jesus speaks and says, so he, the father, divided them his livelihood. All of his wealth, all of his, listen, all the things that the father has worked for, for all of his life and career, the father, without argument, without debate, in the parable, gives it up to both sons. By the way, we'll get into this Later on, uh, in a few weeks, the older son doesn't refuse. The older son in the culture should have refused and then rebuked his younger brother. The older brother should have knocked his brother out. He doesn't do it. He doesn't stand up in the parable. There's disrespect on both sides going on here. And you think about that. The rejection of authority. The number one thing that a prodigal begins to do is reject authority. We talk about teen rebellion today. Parents, listen. 
Teen rebellion, uh, people, you know, well, it's like, it's like a psychosis, or uh, he, it's like he's doing drugs. He's listen, listening to the wrong music, or the, hey, whatever, but here's the deal. Why does it happen? Teen rebellion is a spiritual event in the, in the life of every child. Make no mistake about it. The Bible says that we've been created in the image of God. We are spiritual creations. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says God has made us body, soul, and spirit. And the reason why teen rebellion, we call it, happens, it happens at an age you can't pinpoint it exactly. In other words, not every 13-year-old will do it at the age of 13. It could be 11, could be 12, could be 15. Uh, for some reason, it seems to be uh, earlier with boys than it is with girls. That The gender doesn't matter. But why does it happen? Because there's something within us at the moment of authority when we begin to realize, hey, I don't think my mom and dad are as smart as I, I used to think they were. They begin to, listen, they, we've all gone through this. You begin to feel a, a little bit of grandizement about yourself. Who are they to tell me? They're your parents. What do they know? You ever hear that kind of stuff? Mark Twain says it's amazing how smart our parents get the older we get. When you're young, you think your parents are nuts. And then when you get older, you realize, hey, they were pretty smart after all. Pretty amazing. There's something in the human, fallen human nature that rejects authority. And you think of young children, it's so precious. The young kids, they're so sweet. You can, you can tell them, uh, give daddy a kiss. And they'll give you a kiss. And you can say, can you, hand, you can, can you hand that to daddy? And they'll hand, and they're so happy about it. And then, you know, uh, even at, you know, maybe nine years old, they're still doing it. Okay, oh, all right, dad, here you go. You know, and then it's like 12, and it's like, hey, pop, why can't you get it yourself? <laughs> Remember Bill Cosby used to tell in his little stand-up uh, joke that uh, he would do when his kids would rebel, he would say, listen, it is that, this is absolutely certain. I brought you into the world, and I can take you out. <laughs> the human spirit, unrestrained, does not want to be told what to do. Isn't it interesting that communism demands that they have control of your children, preferably by the age of five? Did you know that? If you don't know that, you better read about communism. I encourage you to read Marx's writings and Engels' writings on the Communist Manifesto. I encourage all of you to read it. You want to know why? Because you're living it. It's shocking. And the whole push was to get people to adopt a system where the government would be your absolute authority rather than God and to have the people get to that place without parents, he says, ever knowing about it. It's all written down there. Authority. Authority. And the human nature, when it rejects authority, it's funny, the human nature rejects authority and then it turns right around and seeks authority. It throws off the restraints of godliness or God himself or faith or whatever it might be and then acquiesces or gravitates right toward a tyranny. You see this going on in countries in the Middle East all the time. And you see this in the life of people. I will not have my parents to rule over me. And then what do they do? They go right under the authority of a drug or someone, a group, maybe a gang, whatever the case may be. Authority. We need to be very careful as a people. You know, you think about it. If marriage, listen, I read this. It's very cool. If marriage is the most godlike union and it is vital to the culture between a man and a woman then parenting is the most godlike ministry that a parent can ever experience. What, what, what is the father feeling when his son says, I wish you dead, so give me what's coming to me. And that father gives it to him. Listen, in the parable, what is Jesus saying? Well, ultimately, I don't want to let the cat totally out of the bag, but you probably figured out by now that Jesus in the parable is announcing to us, this is the heart of the father. This is the heart of God. I want to do what I want to do, and God will let you do what you want to do. But how much pain do we inflict upon God? 
And that's lived out a million times a day in the lives of parents and their children when the kid says, hey, I'm out of here. You don't tell me what to do. And, and the brokenheartedness of it. And moms and dads break down and they're crying and they're, and they're beside themselves because all of a sudden, little, little junior who they poured their life into turns around and bites the hand that fed them. And it breaks your heart. And the only consolation, if there's any at all, is some, someday Junior will have a son who will do it to him. <laughs> and that's a very carnal thing to say, but, <laughs> but it's no consolation. It's the ultimate pain. It's the ultimate pain. Kenneth Bailey, a Middle Eastern scholar, says that he tells of this story when he was teaching at a Christian seminary in the 70s in Tehran, Iran. And a student of his called him in the middle of the night and said, you need to get over to my house quick. My brother is trying to kill my father. This was a Muslim who had converted to Christianity. And because of that, the son or the brother was asking the father for his inheritance in advance, just like the parable. Bailey points out that three months after the rebellious son had asked the father for, their inherit, for his inheritance, three months after that request, the father dropped dead of a heart attack. And the mother told Kenneth Bailey, my husband died the day, the night that my son asked for his inheritance. That's what killed him. It's such a radical thing. I wish you did. I wish you out of here. I wish you out of my life. A prodigal rejects authority. There's something in someone's heart. Maybe still, I'm not going to do that. I won't do that. They just can't allow themselves to be brought under authority. Listen, they can't hold down a job because the boss tells them what to do. They go from job to job to job because they think they can do it better. The only problem is they don't own the company. They only work for it. There's a rebellious streak. And there's a a prodigal attitude about them. And then they may get all excited in the service. They might hear great worship. The message might convict them. And uh, they say, I want Jesus into my life. And then the, the next moment Jesus tells them what to do, they throw Jesus off. The prodigal. People have asked the question, is a prodigal somebody that is lost? Could be. Or is a prodigal somebody who's saved and goes back into the world and loses their salvation? I don't think your salvation can be lost if you have it personally. Well then, what's going on? And rather than answer that, which nobody can rightly answer, how about this? Why don't you let the Holy Spirit speak to you through this parable? Ask God to speak to you where you're at. But what causes a child to depart from what they have grown up in? What causes a child to leave Home, there's that sense of, I can do it better. I can do my life better. i got to do my own thing. I will not listen to you, Mom. I will not listen to you, Dad, anymore. And they, they break out of what they view as a prison. I can't do anything around here. We've all heard that. Listen, uh, have we not all said that? I mean, I'm thinking back in my mind. Uh, the only thing is, in my, my, in my life growing up, you kept things pretty quiet in my house, private. Uh, I grew up with a Marine and I told my dad one time what I thought about something. I mean it, one time. I remember where I was standing. I remember where I was standing. I remember what time of the night it was. I remember what I was wearing. I was a junior in high school. And I remember waking up off the kitchen floor. <laughs> because I accused my dad of not caring about something. I said, the only reason why you said that is you don't care. Next thing I knew, I was waking up. And I never crossed him again. What causes a child to depart? Well, I think there's a self-realization of self. (laughs) I'm me. Look at me. I can actually drive a car now. I've got 10 bucks in my pocket. (laughs) Whoa. And not to mention, all the chemicals are raging, and you feel great. You wake up, you feel great. You go to sleep, you feel great. You fall off the roof, you feel great, (laughs) right? You fall off your motorcycle, you feel great. You just feel great. And you feel invincible. 
a self-realization of self. And self is sin. I can do this without God. I can do this without mom. I can do this without dad. I don't need anybody, says the person of self-realization. It's all about me. It's me, myself, and I. We're legends. It's fantastic. <laughs> and the Bible says in Proverbs twenty-two fifteen, foolishness, that's self, is bound up in the heart of a child. And the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Isn't that powerful? I know it's illegal to talk about that in the state of California these days, but it doesn't mean beat your kid. Self-realization can be very destructive. What about this question? What fear grips the home when such things happen? When a prodigal rejects authority, listen, the home becomes unstable. It's a painful thing. This father in the parable, I wonder how he slept at night. Don't raise your hand, but have you ever had a wayward child? How do you sleep at night? Is your child wayward tonight? Isn't it amazing? It doesn't matter how old they are. I understand that if your child is 45 years old, there is a sense of, well, let the bum. <laughs> but you're, you say that out of a broken heart. I encourage all of us to start kind of meditating a little bit throughout this series on on the whole incredible divine dynamic of God's creation of family. Family, see, family is tough. Of course it's tough. It's the closest, listen, it's the closest thing you'll ever experience regarding heaven on earth is a family. It's ministry, it's life, it's difficult, it's productive, it's powerful, it's continuing, and you look at a life of a little child, and listen, God is teaching children all about himself through mom and dad. Did you know that? I don't want to get too far off. This is not in my notes. I don't want to derail myself or you, but when you study the scripture and you look at from Old to New Testament alike, the Bible speaks, God speaks of himself in certain contexts with female attributes. Did you know that? Did you know that? In the book of Revelation, whose Jesus, his face is as bright as the sun, his beard is as white as snow, his eyes are a flame of fire, there's, there's, it's the most ultimate masculine manifestation. Jesus, he's got a sword in his hand, and when he speaks, it's like a sword comes out of his mouth. He's riding a white horse, it's Jesus Christ, and the Bible says, across his breast is a golden band. You say, you mean chest? That's the funny thing. It's in the Greek, a female word for breast. Why is that? Because in all of his righteousness, he's the comforter. 